oor een gespit sit en luister. Goedemiddag aan al ons luisteraars wat in die laatste minuut of twee bij ons ingeskakel het. Jy is ingeskakel op die waarheid radio en jy luister vanmiddag naar die rechtstreekse persconferentie van meneer Louis Liebenberg van Forever Diamonds and Gold. Ons sal binnen die volgende paar sekondes begin, so hou gerust jou oore nabij aan die draadloos.
ons gaan aan, um, laat ons maar hou by die tyd, ons mense verwacht, um, Walter nou, as Walter inskyf, ek wil net een praktische reling tref, excuse dan, ek weet, hy is sêke nou live, maar maak die sak nie, uh, ons mense verstaan my, as hy dan inskyf, is hierdie al op die groepe geaccepteer? Het hulle weer en weer en weer gedoen? Hulle moet ek tenminste vier, ek ken my bij nie. Uh, wie gaan sêke maak dat die groepe aan mekaar geplaas word, is het die voor? Ja, want ek sien dat ek nog bezig dan, ja. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Um, obviously, I think I think you from City Press and so on, and then a few other people that I don't know that well. But it doesn't matter. Thank you very much for coming along, taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, I think the way that... Uh, would be best is to allow you to ask me the questions. I can obviously give a background, but what what would you prefer? Which way around? Background first. Background first. Okay. Thank you very much. It's it's actually a permission uh, <laughs> for me to embroider because I'm an Amakwalanda and I talk a lot. But thank you very much. Uh, so. I'll, I'll give a background of, obviously, there's a lot of issues in the press and has been uh, mostly in the Afrikaans press, um, uh, especially Rapport and, and obviously the sister paper, City Press, but uh, there's a lot of other, especially Radio, SAFM, as far as I know, and Pretoria FM. They've been phoning and I've been giving them an earful. So, all right, background. The background to this whole saga uh, has started uh, only about six months ago. If we talk about uh, the Mr. Ramaphosa, you saw he just left the building now. I don't know whether you were here when he left. Um, what did I Ramaphosa? I've got Ramaphosa on my mind all the time. So, I mean, he's, a, he's such a nightmare, I think, for all of us. We're just too afraid to admit but uh, so he actually appears in my daydreams as well. So all right. So what happened is that when um, give me the date when I s um, had this uh, experience, a lot of people told me before about uh, Mr. Zuma. A lot of them, uh, and I read the book, and I must now try and think back of Adrian Basson in 2013-14, Zuma Exposed. Uh, you can help me. I haven't got the book anymore. I just uh, dumped it in file 13. Was, was yeah, one of the worst books I've ever read and, and very badly researched, may I say. I think he did an afternoon job between four and five and his editor has placed a lot of pressure on him. Afrikaans people tend to uh, when buckle under pressure, we see it with the Springboks from time to time when it's really when the te when when the chips are down. It's a it's something of our past. It's in our DNA. We're a bit unsure of ourselves. We're a young nation, and we don't know whether we're Arthur or Martha from time to time. But then we've got very good Afrikaners, people that are objective, that seen life, people that has um, seen the good and, and bad of life. So I've been, uh, after my uh, first marriage, where I've got two children, I uh, got married in 1985, my third year at Potchefstroom University as a law student, and she fell pregnant. I don't know how, because I did nothing, uh, as always. <laughs> and fact of the matter, she fell pregnant, and I had to get married because I'm, I come from a reformed background. My father was a, was a preacher. So it's very easy in Afrikaans. They say, you bed op gemaakt en moet dan slaap. So I didn't have a choice in the matter. I think it took about 20 seconds, but I mean, I am the father. So what has happened after that? I got divorced in the year 2002, but my wife left me uh, in the year 2000. I've been 12 years um, 
a quasi legal advisor. I, I've got a law degree and I bought a few others. And I then worked for Southern Life for 12 years. All right. Yeah, I, I think you're going to have a lot of that today. But it's true. I bought it in England for 2,000 pounds. So I'm actually a doctor, but I mean, I can't, uh, I can't be that because it's like not even a B degree. So there's a lot of degrees that you can buy, but I mean, some I really got at, at the real university. Okay, so my wife left me, and in 2002, I ended up on the street, 2001 actually, ended up on the street in Benoni as an outie for nine months under a tree across Christus Cafe, and I was like heartbroken, and I spent my time wine, women, and song basically until I, I exhausted myself. It's like a midlife crisis type of thing, uh, and I'm a bit emotional. I'm an opera singer type, and uh, I took it very hard. The reason I'm telling you that is because there, as an outie under that tree across uh, Christos Cafe, next to Tom Newby School, I had a sort of a spiritual uh, experience, prayed, and more like pleading to God to help me out of the situation, because once you've squandered your life, it's like the prodigal son. You're not angry with yourself and everybody else and the world, but actually it was your own fault. Uh, so I'm used to, to breaking down and then building up. So what I did then in 2002 is, or 2001, I started singing in bars and so on. And then one night in 2004, I felt the urge during, uh, again, a prayer session where I was more pleading than praying. Um, that I had to, Padre Fonte is a Latin phrase called go back to the fountains of your father. And I went, I hiked to Port Nolith without a cent, with, one, with just the shirt on my back. A lot of people say that they've lost everything. Then they still have a car, a house, a canary and three Maltese poodles. I really lost everything. And that has put a different kind of perspective. When you, and out here on the street, you know, life is very slow. You see the old Tani coming out and feeding the pigeons. You see everything very clearly. I can see clearly now, obviously, a song that's been written during one of those episodes in somebody's life. And, okay, then I went to Port North, and I started looking at the boats, and, and I saw that the diamond industry, you know, you're very much impressed uh, with the, the Oppenheimers and the people with money when you come from a pastor's home. And I saw, you know, the boats and all the problems that they have with the diamond diving on the West Coast. It's a type of, it's a certain type of person that you find on the West Coast, Port Nolith, Alexander Bay, Urani Munt, um, also parts on the, uh, on the coast of Namibia where, Nam where the big brothers are, are mining, the Beer, Transex, uh, and also Alex Corps, where a lot of uh, the current... Um, investigations are taking place. You don't read a lot about it, but it's, it's a very important event for me in my life. So I went there, and I looked at the situation, and I thought, okay, right, let's, let's try and get money together to buy a boat. Now, as an outie with nothing, uh, batting for food every day, and I had six other outies with me that I had to look after, it was quite a bit of pressure. And uh, anyhow, I started working there, looking at the boats, and so on. And then I went down and I booked into the Table Bay Hotel and I said to them, uh, sorry, I forgot my cards. And, uh, and they allowed me to book into the five-star hotel in Table Bay. And then I, I went to concierge and I said to them, listen, uh, also help me because I need to fly down 15 couples from uh, my previous life, southern life and so on, people that I knew. And I, the hotel allowed it, and they flew them down on their account. And then I booked the pavilion, which is uh, like a conference center at Table Bay, and that was for 17,000 rand, and I then delivered a speech. The only, uh, the only requirement was for these people coming down from all over was that they listened to me for two hours that there's diamonds in the sea. Now, coming from that area, obviously we know that, but at the time in 2004, just about nobody knew about diamonds in the sea on the West Coast. It sounds ridiculous, but today with the internet and all these things, it's easier to understand. So I, 
so then I delivered a speech for two hours, and the people gave me checks uh, worth three three comma two million. You know these people that came down. It was quite a bit of money at the time. We didn't have a buggered up country like now. Eighteen twenty, uh, we didn't pay for a for a dollar. It was still a proper country. You know people were looking after the country and so on in two thousand and four still, and there was ESCOM still had lights. We didn't have Ramaphosa. What a disaster for the country. You know so, things like that. So, anyhow, so uh, they gave me the money, but then I couldn't go and bank it because, you know, I don't have an account. So I went to APSA, and eventually this uh, woman agreed to see me, the branch manager, and I went in there, and I said, she said to me, uh, I said, I want a savings account. She said, okay, would you just hand me your ID? I said, I don't have an ID. I'm sorry. I lost it a long time ago. And she said, okay, but where do you stay? I said, uh, well, three, five, branch number three. She said to me, that's not very helpful. We've got FICA, RICA, all these things that uh, draconic type of legislation coming in to try and keep people away from doing bad things or good things, or whatever the case may be. That was the start of the uh, the police state at the time already, you know. You know this FICA thing, you can't move, you can't do anything because you have to report, you know. So anyhow, so I got this account after two hours. The APSA gave me this account, and uh, and the account number is nine one three four two three five four five three. And I mentioned that because for years I only had that savings account. Through that savings account, uh, in the next uh, uh, four or five or eight months, I put one hundred twenty six million that people gave me at the time in two thousand and five, and so. So they trusted me, and uh, there's a reason for it, and that's why people don't understand why 40,000 people at the moment can give me money every day to buy diamonds, to buy mines, to buy and sell, to do whatever the case may be. And I tell them, please don't put more than 10% of your money with me because it's, it's high risk. High risk and venture capital is not something that the JSE or the banks or anybody in the formal sector likes. Uh, so legislation has put us so much in the corner that we can't grow the economy. So obviously the rich uh, made the legislation. So you've got the Bank Act and then a Bank Act 2 and the Bank Act 10 and the Bank Act 100 and then the Skadelike Besigheidspraktijk uh, and then you've got the DTI and the TDI and, and whatever the Reserve Bank and plus the, which must be nationalized if we want to save this country by the way, but that's just by the way. We, we, we think that we're living in a democracy, but we're actually living in a stupid state. We, we're living in a situation where we should be socialists, but we're trying to be democratic. It's not working out. We must be a perfect combination of the two. And Julius Malema is quite right in saying that the mineral wealth and the riches should be in the hands of ordinary people because it's been held in the hands of 0.1 or 1% like the Ramaphosa's and, and uh, the cronies, his, his cousin and so on. So the, the guys that take over ESCOM. So we're sitting in a situation where ordinary citizens in South Africa at the time, it was very frustrating for all of us. And I decided, no, well, after the time I've been on the street, I could see what was necessary and what we needed uh, was venture capital, but proper venture capital that like you've got in the rest of the world like in America. I'm not talking about Europe. Europe is, you know, an interesting thing. Once I started to try and list the company on the alternative investment market in London, and I walked the streets of London, so to speak, and I saw 17 nominated advisors in 2007, what happened then? Suddenly the, the Afrikaans newspaper started writing. At the time it was David van Rooyen and uh, uh, what was a Wasserman, Helena Wasserman, uh, her dad did some consulting as far as I know for the beer, so she had a vested interest. You always have a vested interest, you know, somebody's telling you to do a story, okay? And uh, I don't know who told you to do the story, but somebody's giving the instructions. This is how it works, so you've got the pecking order. So you're the journalist here at the bottom and you just say, okay boss, I'll go, and then you start writing whatever they tell you to write. And once you get back to the office, then they change it. They edit it for a hundred million times so that it tells the narrative that they want, that the rich people want, and the ones with the money behind it. So that's just my philosophy. You get a bit of my brain in the process. So, and I see a lot of people laughing, you know, whilst they watch this. And that's that clown, Liebenberg again, talking about the truth. 
talking about the truth. The truth is something that we hate in this country. Oh, you know, you don't need to worry about it, then you're in serious trouble. Okay, but let's try the truth. So the truth is that in 2007, I started trying to list this company on the alternative investment market. And I went around the country with the nominated advisors, Doug Braddock and Alex Cranbrook from Bell 9 in London City. And they were all excited because we didn't have any debt. Uh, we had 11 boats. We had nine uh, shoreline operations. We had uh, like 56 divers and uh, about, a, let's call it about 60 or 70 workers across the country. So we were employing people. And in Port Nolithi at the time, there was 29 diamond boats. So 11 of those were quite a percentage. And then I was called in by Mr. Mdaka and by Jeff Davies, uh, you know, uh, people that controlled Alex Court at the time. And they said to me, listen, Louis, um, we noticed that you've got, uh, il you know, 20 contracts. Now, we normally allow only two. I said, but you allowed it and, and you signed it. He said, but no, we didn't know that it was all you. I said, what's the difference? In time, I realized that monopoly means that we don't allow people to come from nowhere and start in the diamond or gold business or silver or platinum or one of the resources that and at the moment coal, as we can see, you know, you must be connected. And it's got nothing to do with BEE because BEE at the time, the requirements for that wasn't as high as it is today. In state departments, you have to have like 51%, which is understandable, but it's still difficult to make a living after 30% tax. Fact of the matter is, at the time, we were growing too big, okay? And the powers that be got worried, okay? So they started frustrating me, also froze my account, then in 2007 for the first time, 2008, twice, and this is how they work. I mean, if I talk about they, we're talking about the mafia, the financial mafia in this country, the JSE, the banks, and formal industry, because they hate competition, and we've seen it, how difficult it is for people to enter, and that's why BE is not that successful in this country. If you take Motsepe, for example, uh, Ramaphosa's cousin, you've, you're sitting in a situation where he's a very wealthy man. But at Sunlam, at 30 years ago, he was nothing. He was an advocate without a car. And then, obviously, he sold the shares. Now, that's good, but what does it help the ordinary citizen in South Africa? It doesn't help them at all. So you've got a few people at the top making money and then fighting to stay in power. And this is what me and... Um, President Zuma just discussed in this office behind me now, is you're sitting in a situation that the th same thing is happening again, total manipulation of the economy and using the state apparatus and the law. And as you know, I'm, I've only got a B-Juris law degree and the rest I bought, as I said, and I, I spent a bit of time doing a master's degree a, at UNISA. I didn't finish that uh, in business leadership. But I remember, once I've learned what I need to know about something, I just leave it and do something else. Because we, you don't have to do four years, five years, ten years. You just have to do six months and just learn. And I'm a student, so I learn. Like I'm learning body language in the room at the moment. I'm checking out people. and <laughs> they, <under> <laughs> they, they find it quite amusing, but this is a real story. Um, this is a real story I'm telling you, and it's too, it's too hard to believe because ordinary citizens can't go through this shit. You know, it's too hard for them because normally they give up before uh, they get to the point of really making money. So, right. So this is not a BE issue. This has been an issue pre-1994 as well. That the, as long as the state can keep the rest of the citizens as poor as possible, Okay, and they make the money and control. I mean, FW did it. Now, Jan is maybe listening. He's been my friend. FW's son has been my friend at university. So he knows what I'm talking about. When he got a lot of money because his dad was paid handsomely uh, with uh, President Mandela, they would, weren't only paid the three million. They were paid serious, serious, serious money during the transition. I know because I've been, uh, I've been a friend of uh, Tani Marika's. I've, I've toured the country with her, and I warned her against Uncle F.W. at the time that was a dangerous individual. So 
I've been friends of the family, so um, hopefully Jan is speaking. Hello, Jan. Ga naar je broer. Ga naar je Ford XR3. A blue, light blue one that I paid for the petrol for a few years. Okay, so in that process, um, obviously I looked at life very differently. And now I'm darker and Jeff Davies had to control. And they called me down to Parliament for Public Works to go and explain all these contracts I had with Alex Corp. And I said to them, it's easy. I had, I had just different private companies. And I, what I do is I get a boat. All right, I ask people to give me six, six million. I take three and the boat gets three, 50%. Makes me run the operation. And in the meantime, I became the largest producer of Alex Corp within a question of 18 months. But now they take note. And although we don't know it, surveillance is a terrible thing in this country and in the world. They watch you, and then they get, get the instructions. So the story is, if you become big, then they call in Eliana Wasserman or somebody similar to try and break you down. Then they start writing about you. At the time they wrote, in 2006, they wrote things like, Louis says he's a professor that taught Latin at Potsdam University. No, I did because I did very well in Latin. I taught practical lessons. That is what I said. So I spoke Naskiturus Pru Yam Natus Habitur Quotes the Gamodu Yu Agitur. I could speak Latin fluently at the time, but not anymore. As you can see, I'm an old man and I've had too, too many women and not enough sex. That is what puts you under pressure. Okay, so. Here's the story. So then the instruction went down to Parliament and Public Works calls you in. Now, if Public Works doesn't succeed, so I had the most money at the time to get the contracts for Alex Court to go to the midwater. You understand? So now I've got the big boat, Namakwa, that I bought from Tohi Sukwale and from, um, from Johan Rupert at the time because they ran uh, Malapenda. I can't remember the company, but they had a big ship called the Namakwa. And I bought it on auction. It was a hundred million ship, but I bought it for two and a half million because they didn't have any use for it anymore, and I convinced them to sell it to me. But now I'm looking for a contract in the midwater, and I'm competing with, with nobody except the Russians at the time uh, that said that they would come to South Africa, but they didn't. I wish they did because South Africa would have been in a better situation now than Ramaphosa running to the west and selling us out. So we need Russia, we need China, we need uh, people that understand business and Africa because the West sure as hell doesn't understand Africa. We are a different breed and Afrikaners are a different breed and all of us are very different. So we are go-getters like my ancestors came over the Drakensberg. We've got guts. We've got a lot of guts like the Zulus. That's why I like the Zulus so much. We are very much the same. In fact, we family. I think we from the same mother. We're just twins. So. Anyhow, so in this process, I discovered the discrimination in the economy, and it's terrible. So, as I say, the instruction first comes to frustrate you. So they talk about irrelevant stuff like your background in mining, as though that is important when you understand business. Whether you're selling condoms or coke, it's the same thing. You buy it $7 and you sell for 14 You double your money. That's what you do. It's fine when you have got a cafe in the corner. But the minute that you touch the diamonds, the gold, the silver, the platinum, the, the coal, then suddenly the papers start writing. Isn't that strange? They don't write about the coke. They don't write about condoms. Why don't people write more about condoms so that we ca can get less of, a, of, of a, a pandemic in this country so that we can just die in a different way, but not the forced way like we are going through at the moment. And I'll explain that a bit later. So... In Elex Corp, we already had the corruption. So I wrote on carte blanche. I see carte blanche has got now that, that uh, two-minute interview that took me 120 minutes <laughs> to talk. But it was a two-minute interview. Thank you very much, Derek Watts, friend of Teresa Kutsia. What happened then is that in that process of 120 minutes, people just want to tell one story. Louisa Crook... He's doing smuggling. He sells diamonds uh, uh, illegally. He works with the Zama Zamas. Um, 
you know, and he fought loud in church. You know, so all that kind of nonsense, the press start writing. Irrelevant stuff. So Eliana Wasserman bought and sold, started writing every Sunday on the front page, like the report is doing right now. So I don't know who gave the instruction this time. It's, I, I, maybe I must just lock into the cell phone conversations again, like Teresa Kutsia has given me for two and a half years. And I can help you with a lot of information that was discussed by the editors of Rapport and Built. It was quite an interesting. Eventually, they gave her a warning letter that she must leave the company because she, they thought that she was giving me information. Of course she would give me information. I mean, when you're in bed with a woman, they talk. You know, especially, um, they tell you a lot. You know, so, I mean, I got a lot of information about the media and I can share a lot of that like they're doing with me at the moment. You know, sharing bits and pieces. Am I there? Oh, sorry for... Okay, so, in that process, I really learned about life. Apart from one wine, women's song, racehorses, and all those things, I've learned how crooked people are. And, and we've been taught totally incorrectly, the Zulus and the Afrikaners. We must have respect for authority. No, no, no. You should not respect authority because they will misuse it. That is a well-known fact in South Africa and the world over. That's why we are all vox populi, vox dei. We, we, we can't get anywhere. You know, the voice of the people are not being heard. That's why we've got such a lot of people staying in squatter camps. 54% of South Africa are poor. And the rich are telling them every time, my dear fellow citizens, sorry, the economy is buggered. But they don't explain to them that they are responsible for the economy that's buggered. So, all right. So, I didn't get the listing. And the story is very simple. If you keep on telling... Uh, 1,534 investors or shareholders at the time because they first come with the Reserve Bank. So the Reserve Bank, now you must register a prospectus. Okay. You, you're down the line now. You've got money. You've got boats. You've got a business going. You take out diamonds. You're the biggest producer. But now you must get a prospectus. Why? Because the wealthy said so. And the law said so. So how the hell did this law come about? It came about because of roads that push, pushed Barney Bernard to over, overboard and he died. And then, since then, it's just the bloody roads and the Oppenheimers taking over the country and taking our mineral wealth overseas, selling diamonds at a hell of a high price and, and, and just working people out of their, their property over here. Julius is quite right. So I found that in the system. And obviously I'm angry. I, 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 you know, let's say, Bootman is the Muren. You know, in Afrikaans. Now, this Bootman, I remain the Murin because I can see, I can see, and I'm old enough with gray hair and a small penis to see what is happening in this world. It's very good to have a small penis because you try harder. That's the nice thing about that. So, here's the story. In South Africa, in the year 2006, I wrote to Carte Blanche. Derek was also there. He was. Also tall, but he had more hair. I wrote to Derek Watts and I said, listen, there's a lot of corruption going on at Alex Corp. But obviously they didn't want to know it. Not from me. Not from me having the most boats and the biggest production. No, no, no. They had to ruin me. The Afrikaans press, weet jy who is Afrikaners? Jylle weet hoe is a kreef, ne? Jy kreefies. You just try and get up. Then the Afrikaner would bite you in the ass. Wah! Even come down here, we lack a year, we lack a year, we want to be down in the doldrums. And because I understand being on the street, I understand what they mean. If somebody moves with a nice car next door, everybody checks. That's the way we are. And then you start talking about the people. Now, obviously, at the time, I wasn't on social media. You know, I only heard one or two people, so I still had a lot of faith. Because the less you know, the more faith you have. Okay. That's the simple things that Jesus told people in Matthew. Bring the children to me, because to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. Not to these smart people around the table today. The kingdom of heaven doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the simple-hearted. It belongs to the squatter camps. It belongs to the people in Iriaka. It belongs to the people in Orania. It belongs to the people in Gugaletu. 
that do not know how to make a living because the rich and the famous are stealing all the money. Okay. And prohibiting the ordinary man to get up. Okay. That's why there's so much corruption. Because they see that you can make a quick buck if you're in politics. And then, therefore, they start doing things that's not right. Right. So I've learned my first lesson. And instead of listing like Petra, diamonds that listed just a month or two before Wealth for You could list. We were live on the board already. Live. And then they stopped. And then luckily for them, 2008 came. Another excuse to drop the economy. The rich people do that. You know, they inflate like they're doing in America now. Getting higher and higher interest rates. Just the ordinary person can't keep up. And then they take their house back. And, and it's like in going in South Africa with the farmers. We want new farmers to enter the industry. But the liquidators are just coining it all the time. So who's the biggest crooks in this country? Liquidators, auditors. And who? Lawyers. Biggest crooks in this country. Because they can, they can hold you at ransom all the time. Especially in the criminal law, you sit in that cell. Okay, now yes boss, no boss. You suddenly become like in old South Africa. Yes boss. Okay, no boss. Okay, and they sit and then stand and they sit and they stand as though you've lost all your identity. Okay, so when I go in there, like uh, they, they're threatening me now, they're going to arrest me again. When I go there, I take the biggest rank, I, I take his rank off and I make him equal to me. If I can, I bump him with the head like in Namakoland. Uh, but then, you know, obviously they're angry and they arrest me again and again and again because of stuff like that. But why do people do that? Because you know it's a farce. You know it's bullshit. And the minute that you realize that this whole bloody system is bullshit, you can't have respect anymore. That's why people have, don't have respect for the law in this country. Because they see what the rich and famous do and how they get their money. And then suddenly they say to themselves, well, you know what, let's try a quick buck. Let's try and hijack. Let's do these things. And then nothing happens to them because the cops, as we know, are the most crooked department in the country. There's no more crooked in the whole world than the South African police. So when they arrest me, obviously I've got no respect. Okay? But I judge individuals. So I would see, this is a person that respects me, that understands human rights. It was interesting. When they arrested me for a jeep that was standing eight months at my farm in Luchtenburg, that the guy gave to me, that I've got a, I had that 90 Great North, I had a house for outies, and I used to go there, I had a room there. So that, that jeep was standing in my, yeah, yeah, I can see. You see why I told you, you shouldn't tell me that I must talk. Now, Marco Landers, we do this, you understand? Okay, now we get to what I've done 2016-17. I went to Namakwaland again because I don't give up. Once they start writing and they liquidate you, you just must jump another horse. And it's not what you think. You jump another horse. You just drive forward. You just say Fuerwarts March like we say in Afrikaans. Because if the system is so corrupt, you must beat the system. Okay. And you must make sure that ordinary people can get the mineral wealth of this country in their hands. And you stop the corruption. And you start talking about it, and that's called democracy. We are not used to democracy. You know why people are, are not understanding what I'm saying at the moment? Because they're not used to democracy. They're not used to people calling a spade a spade. They are always diplomatic, and the Afrikaans people are very, they, they're from the Reformed Church, the NG Kerk, or the Gervemeerde Kerk, the Happy Kerk is they better. They better. They understand to give their tenth. They tie. They give it to the church so they understand me. But the rest, the very conservative church, they don't understand a word I'm saying because they have to bow to the king. Sorry, jammer. Okay, papa, jammer, jammer. Jammer, ek het gepraat aan die tafel. And then your father still gives you a clap for saying jammer. You understand? That is how it works in the Afrikaans community. That's, we don't under, that's why we don't understand democracy. Okay. So in 2016, I went down... Uh, again, and I started working in Port Nulleth and also in Zimbabwe, saw some of the generals there that, you know, you get a, f a ticket, you know, by accident there, then you walk around there because you can't afford the hotel again, and so on. So I know, I understand about making plans, you understand. I understand people in the street. That's why we took 38 of these outies, 
and you can see all the streets are clean here. If you came in here, you would have noticed. All the streets, all the blocks are clean because they, they're not off now, but they come and work and clean the area and we pay them because we have to do those things in order to. And you will see, it's an interesting thing. When they walk in the street now, all the people, they pick up the papers and they put it in the bins that yeah, uh, the people have put there. It's an amazing thing that happens if people take control of a situation. And that's basically what I'm doing via Forever Diamonds and Gold. And also through the Varet, through the truth media, because we need the truth. We need the truth desperately. And I'm going to give you the truth today. So then I started supporting the Zama Zamas. Okay. And the way I did it at the time, it wasn't to smuggle. I collected money from people. I said, give me 100,000. Give me so. Let's try. Let's try and help these people get the permits. And you would notice that I've been fighting in Kimberley in the high court against the beers at the time that took away the Zama Zamas. There was about two and a half thousand of them. We gave them food. We gave them everything. Is it still on? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, I thought somebody's asking a question. That's fine. Okay. So, and in, in that process, I was coined as a smuggler. But what the interesting thing is, the, pe the police could never prove a thing. They could never catch me. I, they took me under camera there, seven of them, and then they tried to, with their old old tactics pre-1994 without a constitution trying to tell you, you know, you must be very afraid. Now, I don't get afraid. I don't fear anything. I fear God. That's it. So, that's singular. So, if people try, you know, people <laughs> on Facebook, they tell me I'm going to jail a uh, skulk van a Marwe. I mean, I'm in court with him on Thursday. He tells me, I'm, uh, what, what he's trying to do is to prove that he's putting me into jail. Like he's proved he's, 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 uh, he's conquered the whole COVID thing by himself, him and his wife alone. You know, so we get individuals like that on social media and they go on and on and they're so big and grandiose because why? Just do the stuff. So I did the, I did the stuff, you see, and I took the beers to court with a bit of money I got. And then initially people criticize you because you're trying to make it, then they make it difficult. Then the beers come along and they say McDonald's from the beers. And they say, okay, right, fine. You can mine here and you can stay here. Just go on holiday. When you come back, we're going to have ablution blocks there. We're going to build this and that. By the time the guys got back, there was just a notice that they, you know, everything was go. And the bulldozer came in and took, all, took away all their private possessions. But nobody complained about it because it's only an outie. It's only a digger. It's only a zama zama. Why, why do you think zama zamas are there? Those guys worked in the industries like the gold and the diamond industry. They know the areas. They know there's gold and diamonds left. But the rich and the famous closed the mine. They closed the mine like the beers. They vacate the whole town because on their scale of economy, if you talk about the um, Rankost of Balancierings I I'm trying to get to the English of that now. Okay, so, so on their scale of working, where they're big machines and offices with thousands of people, you can't mine economically. So you need a smaller miner, a combination between a Zama Zama and a guy with a bit of money. That's what you need. Okay? But a real partnership, not bullshit. Not like the BEE we got in today. We get somebody working there in the street. We come here, let's give you 50%, I'll give you a thousand rand by the end of the month. That's what, what people do window dressing and stuff like that. I'm talking about real partnerships. And I, I started those real partnerships and I was really I was really pissed off again with the system because instead of the police understanding that the five thousand people are going there because they don't have jobs, they can't feed their family. That is the bottom line, Mr President. Those people cannot feed their families. We're going under here. We are losing businesses. We are losing houses and cars, and we are losing everything. Thousands of cars being taken away on a monthly basis. Now, that's the people that have a good life. What about the people at the bottom of Maslow's theory that are looking for security and shelter and food and basic stuff like that? That's why I'm there. That's why I'm this animal. Because I don't give a shit about the 1% on top. I give a shit about the 99% down here. This is what I'm giving a shit about. Now, 
When you do that, they call you Robin Hood. Okay? Because they must call you something to take you down. You're taking from the rich to give to the poor. No. What you do is a combination. You're getting people with a bit of money, with no hope, because the Afrikaner at the moment, let me tell you something, they don't have hope. They're on antidepressants, on Obilify, and on uh, Epitech, and I mean, just like write a script. And you go to, just go to any doctor now. They will tell you everybody's depressed. I mean, I, mean, I was married to a bipolar woman for 17 years. It should be about 4% of the population depressed. Now it's like 50%. You talk to people, Duff! you talk to people on Facebook, hey! 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 That's how, hey! it's like a karate match, you know. All the time, you're fighting with people all the bloody time because there's no love in the system. Everybody hates everybody because let me tell you something, women need security, so that's the first problem. What they say is that they need money. If the money's gone, the security's gone, the woman is gone. So you've got a lot of divorces like I've gone through and so on and so on. So the system falls apart. The fabric of society is falling apart. And what we're saying is, stop this nonsense. Don't allow the 1% to have everything. Because one of these days, the poor will storm the castle. And that's already happened in Durban. So, that brings me now to six months ago, or seven or eight months ago, when, once again, I was praying about the situation in this country, like we all should like we all should. We are made by God, all of us here, but we act so big. Nobody's big. 27th of August. Oh, so how long ago is that? Oh, shit, but it's more than that. The 27th of August. No, 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 no. Okay, August, September, October. Okay. No, man. That's the second time. The second time. I'm talking about this first time. About six or seven months ago. We'll get the date. I was praying, and I, I went through a seven-day fasting and praying. It's something that a lot of people don't know about. I see they get ongemakkelijk if I talk about that. It should be standard. It's good for the body, it's good for the soul, but it's very good for the spirit. Because then you can start connecting to your real self. And I was praying about this, and I was praying about the vicious situation that happened at Durban. And Durban was only the start. Durban was only the start of poor people telling Ramaphosa, you're an asshole. He should know that. People, people, assholes know that they're assholes. Have you found that? You know, real assholes know that they're assholes. But they look in the mirror, I'm, you're not an asshole, you're not an asshole. No, no, my fellow citizens, my fellow, no, not an asshole, not an asshole. But when he's off camera, he knows that he's an asshole. But he's, because he's destroying the country. The first thing that should have happened in Durban if we had a real president, a statesman, like President Zuma that was here just now, a statesman, not a politician, a statesman, what he does as he says, come here, President Zuma, we've been comrades, we've had the struggle together, you've been at Robben Island, you've paid your 10 years, you've been in exile, you've paid your price for the ANC, you pray, pay the price for the liberation of the people. Come here. I pardon you. That's what a king does. That's what a real president does. No, but we've been brainwashed for 22 years. I mean, imagine this is a democracy. A democracy. I've been seven and a half years in court. You know what that does to the soul? I look at this man today, and as he was sitting here before, just an hour ago sitting here and he speaks of love and acceptance and peace in the country everybody that was here would would agree with me it was an amazing experience once more so i went down to Ankandla because i felt the calling now all the enemy groups and all the shit houses in this country do not understand what i'm talking about when you connect with the spirit when you connect with god and you listen to his voice now, you can only watch television. You can go one channel to another and you will find, oh, the poor are storming the castle in Durban. And then you can do a bit. Uh, I did stats in my second, uh, was it first or second year at UNISA um, during my master's degree. Prof. Priakul told me something about deviation of the mean. 
So you've got this graph there, there, and then the deviation of the mean would be mean how far in would this be? And you can actually guess. So Ramaphosa could have looked with his cabinet. Okay, cabinet, come, 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 come. Not on television like now. Okay. I'm not going to come and explain pala pala. I'm just hiding here behind all these IT stuff, all these wires. I'm hiding. I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to take the population into my confidence. I'm going to bullshit them another three months. Just get another judge. <laughs> Just get another. I don't like this judge. Come, 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 come. What, what, what are you going to say here? So you're talking about independence in the law. President Zuma, 22 years. It's more than the Nuremberg trials. But democracy in South Africa has come to such a low sewage status that we do not realize that it's impossible for a man to stay in court for 22 years and we can still call ourselves a democracy. Now they call, call, oh yeah, what does the press say? Stalingrad. They've heard a word. So everybody says Stalingrad, 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 Stalingrad. You know, Stalingrad. The president is so powerful that he Stalingrads everybody for 22 years. No, it was bullshit in the first place. It was bullshit in the first place. That's why they had to get him for something. What do they do normally? Tax. You get, get you for tax. Or they get you for your um, contempt of court. I mean, who would not like to contempt that court and that judge? If I was in front of Z uh, Zondo, I would have said, hey, 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 what do you think is happening here? 22 years and you're a judge. Now talk about democracy to me, man. So the first two videos of President Zuma told me everything in front of Zondo. Zondo already decided, hey, I'm going to make this judgment. He's guilty. He's guilty. And the crowd starts saying, he's guilty. Crucify him. Crucify him. Out with Zuma. Down with Zuma. In the meantime, we've got no democracy. And the crime is just getting more. More people are being killed by the day. 68 people a day. And we call this a flippin' democracy. Please, man, are we mad? And they call me mad. So I went. And I went, uh, Mkandla's 9th, 9th of April. I went there, 2022, I went to Mkandla. I wanted to see for myself where the, the press lies, like always. Like always, 99% of the time. The only thing they get right sometimes is the weather. Whether or not, I'm not sure. So the weather. But the rest is bullshit. You can go through the whole paper, so the Afrikaans paper on Sunday. They say that I say I'm Jesus Christ. <laughs> How can that guy still be called a journalist after Sunday? Everybody that listens to me knows that I proclaim Jesus Christ as my Savior. And God over all. But then the stupid, flippant journalist, half wit, half brain, writes on a Sunday that I say I'm Jesus. And they get away with it. They get away with it. You cry about Zuma and his private thing for my 500,000. I piss out 500,000 between one and two. For journalists, 500,000 is a lot of money. Not in diamonds, man. You can't even buy a proper diamond for 500,000. But they go on about a man that's been <coughs> demonized for 22 years. Demonized, totally demonized for 22 years. They go on about 500,000. So they don't want justice for Zuma. They don't want justice for Zuma. They want him to die. Disgrace for the ANC. But the people's voice are rising. You can hear the rumble in the jungle. You can hear. If you are spiritual, you can hear the poor shouting the bloods of their forefathers. This is what you can hear at the moment. And this is one of them. I'm a brother of those people. You can say that I've got a bit of money. Money mean, means nothing to me. It means nothing. What, what is... What is important is what we tell in 50 years from now to our grandchildren about the history 
and what the ancestors, my ancestors, that came over the Drakensberg and the Koi and the Sun and the Zulu and the Kosa on the, on the, on the eastern border that we met, what they talk about us. Not what the build and the report and what the city press thinks about what I'm saying now. Our grandchildren will talk about our history. And they will talk about guts or being a coward like Ramaphosa. Cowardice means that you do not pardon a comrade that walked the line with you. We will have respect again for Ramaphosa if he does that. Just that one thing. Old man, you're now 80 years old. You've done your dues. We've got you for how long? And we couldn't in 22 years we got you for contempt of Zondu. Not the court of Zondu. If any other judge was sitting there, it would have been a different judgment. But it was Zondu. That's why Zuma said, no! No Zondu anymore. I want justice. And I felt like that after seven and a half years. The first bloody magistrate said, I didn't rape the woman, she just wants my money. Seven and a half years, 77 appearances, rape in Mother B by, with a broomstick with four guys. Buggered. Then justice comes. Like I told about Alex Korn, the corruption there. Nobody wanted to listen, but Cat Blanche wants to tell people that I'm the scoop. And they do a 120 minutes interview and then broadcast two minutes saying, oh, he's a crook, he's a crook, he's a crook. No, they don't know about 2,600 people I feed every day. Every single day of my life, I give people bread. They don't want to hear about the good stories. They want to hear about the cuck. That's what they want to hear about. That's called shit. Now, so I'm sitting here today, and in a question of two years, I think I got in about three billion or so, a bit more, from people that have faith, that look at the situation. I say, don't put more than 10% of your money with me. Don't put more than 10% of your money with me. If you do, you're stupid, because it's high risk. We're going we're gonna to try and make it. We're going to try and buy the mines, the diamond mines, the gold mines, that should belong to us anyhow, to the people. The rest of the people must get out of the way. They've got their money. Oppenheimer, go overseas, go and sit, have a rest. You know, I had uh, racehorses and I was sitting next to Mrs. Oppenheimer and I told the story before. She had with a hat, like that, you know. They always have a hat. If they've got money, they've got a hat. You can't see them. It's like, ah! And she had like six horses. They've got 300 horses and I've got 10. You know, I also wanted, you know, when you're small and you grow up pretty poor, you think about, you know, if you can only own a racehorse, eh, then, you, then you're the boy. And then you think you're going to make money with racehorses. You don't think about the balls must be cut at one stage and then they can't run anymore. Then they get their thick, like a woman, you know, you marry them when they're 19 and then they become a cactus. You know, within a question of years, then they've got this neck. You know, I mean, it's like, ah, who are you? But then they say, look at your small dick and then you both laugh about it. You know, that's how it works. But in the process, what happens now, Mrs. Oppenheimer sits there with her horses and so she's got a hundred horses in the race, I've got one with a crippled leg. Now I paid like three million for the horse, Judge Jupiter or, or Lubricator, not to be confused with KY Jelly, brother. So, I mean, <laughs> Lubricator was running in this race. And you know, Dave, you remember Lubricator, it was one of the best horses in the country. And I wanted to beat Mrs. Oppenheimer. And that day, Mrs. Oppenheimer, or somebody paid. Hamlul, I think, was the horse that ran against it. You must go and look in form grits and see. And then they paid the jockey to throw the horse on my horse. Just throw it. Like, I'm, I'm checking, I'm winning this thing. I'm winning. I'm making, you know, this, this pauper, this guy that was on the street, going to win this race now. Oh, and then they throw it on me. Oh, you remember that day? And uh, Lubricator was never the same. Got one operation after the other. So the Oppenheimers won, won again, but I was sitting next to her. So she said to me, Young man, what are you doing for a living? I said, um, I'm in diamonds. She said, my husband also had something to do with that. <laughs> that is how the rich are. They've got no fucking idea. They've got no idea about life. 
They just live in their bubble and the rest of the people must stay poor. And they make one law after the other. Okay, we haven't got them properly yet. Now they sit there around the table at the reserve bank or at the, the FIC or where, wherever, whatever. Or else, where do they sit? They sit all over. You know, teasers or whatever. They make the laws, you know, checking. Hey, that tip is nice. Okay, what do you think about how can we bugger over the poor? You know, how can we? And then they write another. Okay, uh, company law number 400. Okay, point six seven five eight A B C D E F G H I A D I Z Z Z. Then they've got the law. Oh, now we've got them back. Oh, but Liebenberg's got another thing. Okay, now we need to make another law. Then Zondo gets in and all the guys get in. They start making laws. Okay. Oh, we've got now. Which one is that now, company law? Which is the last one? I'm, I'm trying to pull in my, my attorney to get in trouble with me, not me alone. <laughs> but he's not volunteering, you see. He's clever. He's been taught by Zondo. <laughs> okay, so here's the story. So eventually, you get frustrated like me. Okay. So, I had a very good... I had 23 girlfriends over this period now, after my wife. I was singing in bars, and you understand, I had an opening line. Would you make love to me on the first date? Now, one, my stats was one clapped me, <coughs> proper. That's the one you know you're going to take to bed. The other nine, three are going to say, yes, but they will duck early, nine o'clock, before you got on your, your, on your second beer. They duck. The ones that said, no, they drink you beautiful, and they come home with you. You understand? That was my stats. Now, in life, it is the same. Exactly the same. You must understand the tough ones are the real ones. The tough ones like me, the tough ones like the Zama Zamas, the tough ones that are there, down there, 30 meters down there, working. Because tonight, I'm not talking about the crooks. I'm not talking about criminals. I'm talking about people wanting to survive in this country. We must loosen up the legislation. We must get the De Beers and all those people to agree to a situation that we are in survival mode now. We cannot keep it for the 1%. The 99% of people are suffering. They cannot pay their bills. And Sasa is just not good enough. And 350 rand is, is going to buy your vote. Yes, Mr. Ramaphosa. That's what you're doing with 28 million or whatever, or 19 million people. You're buying votes for 350 rand because... Those poor guys are so afraid that the government takes away their 350 rand grant a month. That's why they are fearful, and that's why they say yes, and they stand, and they wave to the king. But a lot of us are waking up to the reality that this is bullshit. Okay, so this is what I've done. So we've got 40,000 people giving me a day, and some of them are putting in more than 10%, which is their mistake. They shouldn't do it because this is... And then sometimes they're going to wait later. I just um, bought in to the old De Beers, and I bought out the shareholder there. And so basically, the dream is coming true that ordinary people are taking over the beers from Aqualand slowly and surely. So there is hundreds and hundreds of millions, billions of rands of diamonds still under the ground. But it's just not good enough for the Oppenheimers, but it's good enough for people. And we're taking out, listen carefully, if you didn't listen to all the other stuff, between 7 and 13 carats per ton, not 100 ton, per ton. Do the calculation. The first trance we've done was 35,000 or 40,000 ton we're working through. We're already making around 500 million just with that. Just with a start, there's another 143,000 hectare to work. So the rich people have been bluffing all along. That's why they can build towns. That's why they can build infrastructure. That's why they can build all these things and give all the bursaries. And it makes them feel good. They have dinners, 50,000 a head. And then they sit and they talk about, you know, these poor people are really a bit irritating. You understand? Okay. So where am I now? So the Sunday... The Sunday newspapers don't pick up on what I've done. 
on the quay and the sun and the working together and the good camaraderie that we've got. They don't pick up on what I'm actually doing, lifting up the economy in the Makwaland. They don't pick up on that. You can show them the diamonds, you can show them what you do, you can show them the mines. All they're interested in is a few pieces of legislation that's going to keep you poor. And if they can't do that, like they couldn't do it now, and press please take note, they've frozen my money since December or November 2020, am I right? They started freezing, freezing, freezing. And then on the 5th of March 2021, they froze the 100 change, 100 million change. It's change. In the context of a few billion, that's change. Am I right or wrong? Because they, they worried about 100 million. It's change. All right? So they froze it and I thought, okay, well, that's fine. Keep it. But we won the case. After 13 months, they came with a judgment. Now, again, is that democracy? The judge listens to your case. Then she takes 13 months to deliver judgment. And we call that democracy. We call that human rights. We call it justice. Now, we've got no justice in this country, and that's why the ordinary citizens are losing hope that we will ever have a proper president, like President Zuma again, or his ex-wife, one of the two, only the smokers will complain. Okay? The rest of the people will be fine. But the smokers will complain bitterly because she, she's going to come in. And I think if we can just get a statesman or a stateswoman again to run the country, instead of somebody taking orders from the West, I mean, I'm asking you a question. What the hell is Ramaphosa doing with Biden? What did Biden do for South Africa, except giving us shit? Why is he not with Putin? Why is he not in China? He goes first to run to his handlers in the West. That's where he runs, and we call that a president. Now, I know he's given instructions to Bekitsele to lock me up. I know that. It was told. I, I, I was told by the president's family. They want to lock me up. So all these guys are going mad. We're going to lock Louis up. You know, we're going to bring the Hawks. I'm going, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, you know. No, he's going to run. No, I'm going on honeymoon for eight days if the Hawks doesn't arrest me. So I'll call them first and say, are you going to arrest me? If you want to arrest me, just get me at the airport. Because I'll tell you the time of my flight as well. I can't tell you the, the, the color of my wife's panties. That's a bit off color. But I'll tell you the time of my flight. You understand? So this is the type of things. Now, in the past few years, I've been attacked three times. And the last time was more or less a year ago in September last year, where five policemen and three taxi bus owners shot me on whose instructions? Shot my whole bloody land cruiser to pieces. I only had 310,000 rand in the car. Now they're going to say, you oh, know, you shouldn't have more than 25,000 rand. Every bloody diamond dealer does, does cash business. Don't you know that? What do you want to do with 25,000 rand? Just buy what? A dinky toy. No, diamonds are expensive. And we do it in cash. That's how we do it. So Ramaphosa, he's not alone. He's a diamond dealer. Ten to one. No, we, we're selling meat. These ugly, bloody things on his farm. We're selling them for so much money. No, man. Must be smuggling or diamonds or drugs or something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He will tell us. He will tell us. So we have to find out what the real story is at Pala Pala. But fact is, he's not being pursued. He's not a criminal. Everybody else is. Because he's above the law. Because he appointed Zondo. And once he's appointed Zondo, he's home free. This is the type of criminality in the law. And then introduce conveniently the step aside. The step aside do is like the ballroom dancing. Like everybody was like, step aside. Everybody's gentlemen now in the NC. We're stepping aside. Except Ramaphosa, he's not stepping aside. He's just sitting there, just watching my dear fellow citizens. I'm going to impose another few shit rules on this country. Okay, and so they continue. So, the Hawks, this is the thing in the papers. The Hawks are still investigating. Let me tell you where that comes from. I went down to Uppington, where 
Lindiwe Sisulu, the minister, is now currently in that Pratia Hotel, talking to people. Okay? Talking to people. So across that is the Seidlander. Was that the 5th of April? Thank you. Yes, I didn't have a wife. That's why I married on Saturday, just in time for this press release. You understand? She's helping with it. Okay, the 5th of April, I went there. So Peter Groenewald, you know Peter Groenewald? The guy that speaks slowly. And he only did a doctor's degree in election procedures. And he stays in Stilfontein. Who the hell stays in Stilfontein? I'm like, oh, I'm living in Stilfontein. I'm the leader of the Freedom Front. Which front? Back of, back of front. front. Now, he stays in Stilfontein. Very still. Very still. The Freedom Front. Okay. And what happens then? He invites me. Why? He wants to speak to the Queen's son. Now, if you don't know my ancestry, my, my great, 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 great grandfather came in in 1662 and he married Kritua. That was Jan van Riebeek's translator. She was a whore, you can see, and she was also a very good in languages. You understand? Well, she was. She was a prostitute in the Cape. I can't lie about it. That's my ancestry. It explains a lot about me. I can't help. That's my history. So, why I say that, the Kway and the Sun and the people in this country all want peace. We all want a just system. And we're going to fight for it. So, a few years back, I wanted a bit of brains. Okay? You know, sex is good, but then when you get to my age, you've got a bit of a back problem, arthritis, and all sorts of nonsense then what's in, what, what you then are interested in is above the breast, this side. So my interest was the mainly higher than one meter. So I met this journalist, Teresa Kutsia. Yes. If I only knew, it was at the, she was going to do an article about my poetry. I've got very large poetry groups, uh, the largest writing and poetry groups in this country spending more money on that than all the Artica Fear and the Bruderbond and all the other organizations. I love poetry and I give them, and I'm being criticized for helping the arts as well. But I also sponsor the Black Tie Ensemble, Love Line, a lot of other people sponsor most people because that's what we need. We need artists again to rise up. So I met this Teresa and she wrote about me. But I never knew that she was a player. Okay? So she met me and the first interview she had, she said, you know, I'm actually struggling at home. My husband doesn't give me money and so on. And uh, I gave her 10,000 rand. That was the first interview. And then she went and she's, a, she's riding cycles, okay, bicycles big events. She's a bit of a big woman, big bottom girl, like Queen talks about, but she's like active on a bicycle. And she contacted me from Oatswoden and she said, come. Uh, and when I got there, she had two other boyfriends also. But I found it, this girl intelligent and interesting, so I went so she got rid of the other two boyfriends. I suppose she looked at their bank account and it wasn't really fine. And, you know, we started talking and she said she only wanted to go and lie down a bit. She was tired. And then she wanted to hug and I didn't want to hug. And then the night she invited me to her guest house and I sneaked in, but I didn't want to do anything. I played hard to get because I can see a player on a mile. But then you get yachts. You know, like in Namakaland, we call it that. You get horny. Yeah, so I got a bit horny, but not that night. I controlled myself. So I got back here in Joburg, and she started inviting me uh, to different restaurants that she did reviews on and so on. And we, we started talking. And because of her experience in life and traveling the world and knowing all the celebrities and everybody, she was at Bilt at the time for many years, at Heisgenoot, skinnering about people and so on. But at the Bilt, they like semi-okay, you know, not hard news, you know, just talking about people cycling and farting and running and uh, fauna and flora and stuff like that. 
Okay, so, so it was a sort of a safe industry. And, but in time to come, we obviously started meeting in hotels and so on and so on. So in this process, um, I really fell for this girl, Teresa Kutsia. I fell for her. And I think she was pressing all the buttons that I liked, you know, intelligent, experienced. And then uh, she asked me to invite her husband to the boxing. Harry Kutsia and I used to have a, I bought a boat that he worked on. He was a, the boxer. And he invited me to Emperor's to the boxing and we had a husband there sitting and she was messaging me, how's it, and who like it, like so and so. So it started. Eventually we, we met like almost two or three times a week and it was just having a quickie in a hotel somewhere and then started talking about things and I wasn't really interested in the sex side of things. It's, you know, it's initially, but then eventually you want to talk to somebody. We started talking about things and you started talking about the newspaper, the way they work. And for two years after that, two and a half years it continued, but for two years she sent me everything that the journalists are doing. So she would record everything at Media 24, what her colleagues say, Cabos and, and uh, Johan Ebers and... Uh, all the guys there, even in Voldemort Pelser's office, in the secretary's office, in Inga, Inga's office, because Inga is now obviously the new wife of, who's the guy that's got Alzheimer? Tim. Tim. Tim, Tim So, and she's running the show at Media 24, or, or at Report, I think. And so, recorded, and especially Birkman, Bernard Birkman, she recorded everything he said. And one of the things he said, if you, what are you doing with Louis Liebenberg? What are you doing with Louis Liebenberg? Every time it happens, and then they called her in for um, disciplinary inquiry, and all was there except the Pope. Everybody was there. And she recorded that, and she sent me the recording, and I, and I looked at this, and I said, no, this is... So she had an attorney at Hammond, Paul, and Dixon called Ellen. They did bicycling, bicycling together. And I shared a few affairs with Matthijs Roots, that is a well-known singer, and a few other people that I can't even remember the names of. And Brandon, Brandon that used to be a photographer at the Built, um, he's got a baby now, and so on. So uh, I think they're family friends. So she had a few affairs in the process, but, you know, speaking about it. But the main thing was that the media didn't want her to have anything to do with me. Okay. So eventually they gave her another warning letter and, and I said to her, listen, Teresa, at that time she was taking money from me. Um, she would take money from my handbag and then she said, ah, okay, sorry, I took money. And she acted like she was Mrs. Liebenberg. And she said so. She said so on the phone. You can go through all these years of communication, except the ones that she deleted. So I think at one stage she thought, okay, I'm in trouble now because the build is going to get rid of me. So she approached me and it became just money. When she walked in, she would say, I need 40,000, I need 100,000, I need 200,000. And then I said, okay, so what are they going to do? Now they're going to fire me and they offer me a package of 340,000 for 21 years. And I thought to myself, that's terrible. Do you think you want a future like that? How long have you been in the industry now? 31,000. Yeah. Seven years. Brother, get out. If you get a package of 340,000 after 21 or 22 years, it's going to be terrible. Really. So journalists are being used. This is really how I feel. I, I, I really feel that way. Maybe not you after seven years, you, but you're going to get the itch after seven years. So, so Birkman said to her, okay, you buggered. You're gone, 340,000, that's what we offer you. 340,000. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you the 340,000 and then you take Media 24 on. Then we use all this of two years that you've recorded. We use it against Media 24 because they need to be taught a lesson. 
I mean, yes, they made money with 10 cents and all that, but the rest is shit. I mean, the VAR rate is going to beat their section of media 24 one of these days. Are we? Are we? Of course. We're going to beat them. We're going to have better circulation than them. I mean, that's now, after the Hawks arrested me, I get out, I state my case in court, and, you know, and then we build the media 24.